David and Goliath. David and Goliath, David and Goliath, David and Goliath. Everybody wants to talk about David and Goliath. But before we get to David and Goliath, we have to talk about another relationship that is as important in the literary design of 1 Samuel. And David is going up against someone else. And in this episode, we're gonna be exploring that to understand more about what's happening in 1 Samuel 17. We have a national crisis on our hands, as we learned in part one of David and Goliath. The Philistines are in the Ela Valley, and that is a problem. And as we all know from this story, David is gonna face off with Goliath. But before we get to David and Goliath, we have to get to another pairing first because the design of 1 Samuel is bringing us to a moment where it's not so much about David and Goliath, it's about David and someone else. So as we unpack in the first episode, we are using the lenses of context as we do in any episode of the teaching series. And sometimes we overtly refer to this and most times it's just sitting in the background. But we looked at the geographical and visual settings of this story in part one. What I wanna do in this episode is look more specifically at the literary design and how all of these passages are working together to give us a better understanding of what's going on in the story of David and Goliath. But as we'll see, David and someone else. So let's talk literary flow about where 1 Samuel has been, kind of a major theme that brings us to our present story, is that in 1 Samuel 8, Israel asks for a king. And this was a problem because God was supposed to be Israel's king. But Israel said, no, we want a king like all the other nations, and this is what they're asking for. And in 1 Samuel 9 and 10, Saul is made king. But then Saul does a number of really dumb things. And when we get to chapter 15, God formally rejects Saul as king. And then without Saul even knowing it, Samuel the prophet anoints David as king in chapter 16. David is actually then enlisted into the services of Saul, playing the harp, and then we come into 1 Samuel 17, which most people go, this is a story about David and Goliath. But here's the other character we need to look at first. It's not first and foremost about David and Goliath. It's about David and Saul. Saul is the instilled king, David is the new anointed king. And David knows he's been anointed, Saul does not. So when we come to 1 Samuel 17, the key question is, who's the real king? Is it Saul or is it David? And so in this episode, we're gonna talk about Saul and David, and we're gonna look at the both of them and try to get an understanding of what makes David different from Saul. So let's begin with Saul. How are we introduced to Saul? Because that is an important part of any storytelling mechanism, is that when a character is introduced, you want to take notice because how they're introduced is going to factor in to the story. We get Saul in 1 Samuel 9, 1 and 2, and it goes this way. There was a Benjamite, a man of standing, whose name was Kish, son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of Bacorath, the son of Aphia of Benjamin. Kish had a son named Saul, as handsome a young man as could be found anywhere in Israel, and he was a head taller than anyone else. Now, this introduction is shocking because we get two physical descriptors of Saul. And now we're going to be more formally introduced to Saul beyond his physical descriptions by this here in verse three. Now the donkeys belonging to Saul's father, Kish, were lost. And Kish said to his son, Saul, take one of the servants with you and go and look for the donkeys. So he passed through the hill country of Ephraim and through the area around Shalisha, but they did not find them. They went on into the district of Sha'alim, but the donkeys were not there. Then he passed through the territory of Benjamin, but they did not find them. Now, how a character gets introduced in a story 
is significant. And that's true in the ancient world as well as in modern day storytelling as well. Is that how a character is introduced is indicative of what to come. We tackle those physical descriptors as far as just locking them away. But what we are given here is that when we are given Saul and we're given the very first story around him, we find that Saul can't find his daddy's donkeys. Three times it says, did not find them. They were not there, did not find them. And by the way, this whole passage reads a little bit more colorful in the King James Version. Okay, so you can have a little bit of fun with that. But the fact that Saul cannot find the donkeys is a problem. And when you read the story, you go, if Saul can't find his daddy's donkeys, how in the world is he going to lead a nation? Exactly. That's what you are supposed to think as you open up to this story in 1 Samuel 9 when we are introduced to Saul. And then as you read on, a host of other things happen. And then we come to 1 Samuel 17. We come to the Ela Valley. You've got this major test for Saul underway, who is leading the Israelites. The Philistines are in the Ela Valley. And then we read this in verse 10 of 1 Samuel 17. Then the Philistine, Goliath, said, This day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. It's not just the army, it's Saul included. And here's what's so ironic about this. The irony here is why the people wanted a king in the first place. It wasn't just to be like the other nations. Notice 1 Samuel 8, 19 and 20. But the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then we will be like all the other nations with a king to lead us and to go out before us and fight our battles. And Saul is doing anything but that. He's not demonstrating leadership. He's not inspiring the army. He's not leading them out into the battle. He is not, you know, at the head of the fight. He is abrogating his responsibility as king, and he's doing the opposite of why they wanted a king in the first place. And you go, well, you asked for a king, and that's what you got. But there's another ironic piece here, is that it's Saul, and Saul in Hebrew is Shaul, and <laughs> Shaul literally means asked for. The people asked for a king, they got who they asked for, and asked for isn't doing what they asked for. Like, it's just so ironic here in the text, and we find ourselves in a stalemate here in 1 Samuel 17, under the leadership of Saul. Enter David. And David is very different than Saul. And as the narrative begins to unfold, David has been watching his father's flock. He shows up to bring food for his brothers and food for the commanders. And in the midst of this, David hears what Goliath is doing. And David ends up before Saul and he says in verse 32, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. And Saul's response is, you are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight at him. You are only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. It's like Saul says, David, you are not qualified to fight Goliath. And it's like David says, actually, I'm going to push back on that a little bit. And David then says this, your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he rose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. I mean, what a great passage right there. Now, David uses this word struck twice. And it's the same word in Hebrew. It's the word nakah. It means to smite or to beat or to strike. 
And I think that what David is doing here is that when he is talking about these encounters that he's had with, you know, bears and lions, I think that he's actually referencing his use of both of the instruments of death, if you will, that a shepherd would have on them when they are keeping the flock. Um, the first you know well because it is the sling and the stone. And we're going to talk more about this in the next episode, but this is a devastating weapon in the hands of a skilled warrior or shepherd. And I think that when David talks about how he struck the lion or the bear, I think David is first of all referring to hitting the bear or the lion in the head with one of these rocks, which are the size of a tennis ball. And again, the next episode, we'll go into a little bit deeper detail about slingers and how this all worked out because it's absolutely riveting. The second thing that a shepherd had was a rod or a club. And this was what they would use if they had to fight something up. If it was like hand-to-hand -hand combat, hand versus paw combat, as in David's case. And I think that what David is talking about here is that whenever a lion or a bear took someone from the flock or took one of his animals from the flock, like he used the stone and knocked it across the head, whether knocked it out, knocked it unconscious, or just dizzied the thing enough to get up to it. And then David said that if it came against me after that point, like when it came to a bear or it came to a lion, David's like, I grabbed that sucker by the beard and I just killed it. And David goes, listen, your servant has struck down both lions and bears and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them for he has defied the armies of the living God. Now, when you just step back from David's response to Saul, you go, that's quite a resume. Like if you're trying to figure out, is David fit for the task at hand if he has killed both lions and bears? I think the answer is, okay, we're more entertaining of David going after Goliath than we were before we got his resume. But I think that there's actually something else that David is doing here. I do think it's about his resume, but I think he's going a little bit further. And I think this is a bit confrontational with Saul because the primary metaphor in the ancient world for a king was that of a shepherd. You see this throughout the ancient world. You see this in Egypt, that Pharaoh had a shepherd's crook to remind the people that he was a shepherd of the people. You see this in Egypt, you see this in Israel, you see this in other nations in the ancient world, this idea that the king is a shepherd among the people to lead, to guide, to instruct, to protect. And I think that what David is doing here is I think he's calling Saul out on abrogating his responsibilities as a shepherd. And that when David shows up in the Ela Valley and he hears what Goliath is doing and David is brought before Saul, I think David is basically saying to Saul, Saul, you're asking me, like, what are my credentials? Well, let's just talk about, first of all, what you're supposed to be doing. You are called to be a shepherd to the flock, to the people. And the flock has been threatened and you're doing nothing about it. So if you want to know if I'm qualified, let me tell you what I do as a shepherd. When a lion or a bear threatened my flock, I took care of business and Goliath will be just like any other lion or bear that I have taken out because he has defied the armies of the living God and somebody has to do something about it. And if you're going to abrogate your responsibility as a good shepherd, I will show you what I'm capable of doing. And I think that it is actually pretty confrontational to what Saul would have heard, but Saul has no better idea of what to do David has demonstrated a sense of gusto and a bit of a resume, and ultimately Saul is going to allow David to go and fight Goliath. But I think this is very confrontational. And it's interesting because when you just even go back a chapter and we talk about the very firstborn of Jesse when Samuel shows up to anoint who he doesn't know David to be king. He just knows he's going to anoint one of Jesse's sons. When it came to the firstborn, 
Saul, or excuse me, Samuel saw some things about Eliab and God's response to Samuel was this, do not consider his appearance or his height for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Most of you know this passage in connection to David. This is the most famous passage alongside of the fact that he's a man after God's own heart. And what I find just riveting about this is that the two things that God highlights to Samuel is do not consider the appearance or the height of Eliab. And you go, those are the same two things that we are introduced to about Saul. He's handsome and he's a foot taller than everyone else. And yet we see that it doesn't help Saul in this moment. And that's because God goes, it can never be about your height or your appearance or just your skill set. It's got to be an issue of the heart. And when we come to the story in 1 Samuel 17, we are dealing with a tale of two shepherds. And I just want to finish this episode by just offering a few observations on what made David different from Saul. There was clearly something about the heart of David that made him different than Saul, but I think we can highlight a few things in the story. The first thing is, is that David's service was different than Saul's. That when you recognize that what David has been doing, not just in 1 Samuel 17, but even before this, David is serving King Saul. We get this in the previous chapter. David is serving his father, Jesse, by watching the flock. And by the way, this is after David has already been made an anointed king. I guess not made king, but anointed king. He'll be made king a little bit later on. And yet David doesn't use this as leverage against his father to say, I'm not watching those sheep because the youngest one in the family would watch the sheep and the goats. David is probably out in the field with a bunch of other shepherd boys or girls doing things that, like, you want to be on the battlefront. His brothers are at the battle. That's where you want to be, and yet David is not complaining. He is doing what he is being asked to do. He has served Saul. He's been serving his father. David shows up at the battle line to serve his brothers, to bring them food. And ultimately, we see that David just has a heart of service to God. So one of the things I think set David apart was his service, and it's all over the story. A second thing here is David's capacity. And here's what I mean by that. David has enormous capacity. He's got competency, he's got courage, he's got character. And the thing about David is that when David gives like this resume of what he did when a, when a, a bear or a lion attacked the flock, like what David is basically saying is, is that I have been faithful behind the scenes. When no one is watching, God has been shaping me. I have been working on my skill set as a shepherd. God has been growing my courageous capacity. But what's more is God has been shaping his character. And I just think there's a huge word of admonition here that some of the greatest development we ever get is when no one is watching, when we are being faithful with the little things, when we are being faithful to do things with excellence, when no one sees what we're up to, because it's in those moments that we're growing our skill set, that God is growing our character. And in the case of what David is going to need, his courage was being grown as well. David had enormous capacity. But for many people, that's what they would have leaned into. Their skill set, their talent, what they have been developed into. And yet, that's not what David leans into when we come to 1 Samuel 17. What we see is that David has enormous faith in God. And when you look that servant mentality that he has, his capacity, his skill set, his courage, the character that God has been shaping him to be, and then you put that together with David putting all of his faith and trust not in himself, but in God, that is what I believe makes David different than Saul. 
and that ultimately when we're dealing with a tale of two shepherds, David demonstrates he's the real shepherd, he's the real leader, and he's going to be the real king, a man after God's own heart. And so friends, my invitation to you is just what's resonating with you among these things that set David apart? What is it that you can take away from this story and just in what David is doing that will help you grow in your service capacity or faith in God? So friends, there you go. Part two of David and Goliath. We've got two more episodes in this mini series. And as always, we're hoping that you're finding this helpful. There are additional questions at walkingthetext.com under here that you can go in for your personal study, small group study that you can just kind of ruminate on to take the episode deeper. So as always, thanks so much for watching. Thanks for listening. And may you walk out the text well in your life. 